Because so many people think, oh, if you say something good about yourself, if you brag about yourself, that makes you a narcissist. That does not make you a narcissist. Certainly, you want to be confident in your Hello, hello, Heal Squad. Welcome to another great day we're going to have together. Today might be the best day ever because we are going to hunt down the narcissist. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a second. But first, our quote of the day. People will think what you tell them to think, and you, and you alone, define your value. That is from our guest today, Rebecca Zung. Very excited for this conversation around negotiating with narcissists. We just hung up the phone, funny enough, with Kevin, my husband, who is on the East Coast, dealing with construction rather than this show. And we were joking about how he's the narcissist hunter. So anybody who's going through an ugly divorce or friends who are having sibling issues, whatever it is, Kevin will get involved because he's really good as the brother of a narcissist um, and many more connections to narcissists. But I will let him speak on that. He's really good at helping other people defeat narcissists. But today we're going to learn from a true expert who is going to help us with that. So we are excited to have Rebecca Zung with us. She's a globally sought after expert in the art of negotiation uh, and high conflict communication. She's a best selling author of groundbreaking books, a YouTube sensation with over 40 million views in just three years. She's transformed thousands of lives in over 100 countries on every continent with her revolutionary slay method for negotiating with narcissists. But her journey to success um, wasn't a walk in the park from being a married mother of three at the age of 23, becoming a divorced single mom who dared to dream of law school. She went on to rise through the ranks to become one of the top 1% of attorneys in the nation as recognized by U.S. News. She's been featured in prestigious media outlets such as Forbes, Huffington Post, Time, Newsweek. She's even shared her wisdom with Dr. Drew and others. Her podcast, Negotiate Your Best Life, ranks in the top podcast globally. She's got this great book, Slay, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist, Bully, and Win. So we are going to learn today, friends, how to win from Rebecca. So excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you were laughing about my husband being a narcissist hunter. Um, what made you go from top attorney to this narcissist niche? Mm. I, I kind of it, kicking and screaming in a way because in I actually after I merged my practice with a couple of other guys a few years ago and we decided to come to Los Angeles and I was sort of back and forth initially working part-time as a lawyer. I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do more entrepreneurial things. And I, by the way, I was on extra doing some a little bit of, of help there when big divorces would break, celebrity divorces, I would do some things. But I knew I wanted to do more entrepreneurial things. And in one of those endeavors, I ended up in a business partnership with a female who turned out to be a covert passive aggressive narcissist. And wait, a covert passive aggressive narcissist. You're gonna have to break down what that actually yeah, means. Yeah, I, I will. But I didn't I didn't know what that was either at the time. And I didn't even know what that was until after I got out of that relationship. And you know, it caused me a lot of angst and anxiety and drama and trauma and chaos. And so it was that that really s propelled me into learning about narcissism. And honestly, I started at the same time learning about YouTube and, and, and funnels and how to do digital courses. And everything was sort of a confluence of events for me. But to be honest with you, I was really wanting to teach about negotiation in general. It was when I did one video on YouTube on how to negotiate with a narcissist that, that you know, that particular video took off. And so I thought, okay, maybe I'll do a few more on that. And it's just started to kind of snowball. 
And I, I thought, I really don't want to be the narcissist queen. You know, I, I, mm. I really was thinking I didn't really want to do that. But I, as I started to tell my own story and I started to get more and more emails and, and direct messages, you're saving my life. I, I was thinking of suicide until I, you know, started to do, you know, the things that you were teaching me mm. and, you know. Sounds like I could have used you. Yes. Many, many times along this journey. You know, and the messages that I started to receive, mm -hmm. I really started to think, you know, I believe that maybe God has placed me on, on, on this journey and I, I truly believe that this is my mission now at this point. And so it was so really, you embraced it. Yeah. It, it's been a, now something I'm leaning into, but initially it wasn't, you know, the thing that I wanted to do necessarily because I thought, ah, oh, I don't know. But now I know that I've helped so many people and, and, I, I, I get to speak to the people that I've helped, especially now that I have started my certification program and I have coach coaches that I've trained and many of them have actually started in my initial programs. And it, it's just so unbelievable, the transformation that I've seen. So I just believe that it's a force bigger than me. So for anybody who's listening who doesn't know the true definition of a narcissist because i feel like a lot of times we just start attaching the label to people whatever the label is that's popular and we don't even really know what it means so explain what a narcissist really is yeah it's such a great question and it's such a great place to start because so many people think Oh, if you say something good about yourself, if you brag about yourself, that makes you a narcissist. That does not make you a narcissist. Certainly, you want to be confident in yourself. You want to feel good about yourself. A narcissist is actually the opposite of that. They have the most shame. They feel absolutely no uh, feeling of value internally about themselves at all. That's why they do the things that they do. They, this is a person who feels the most shame, the most empty inside. And, you know, it is a spectrum, and but there is a legitimate personality disorder called narcissistic personality disorder. But as you get closer and closer toward the end of that spectrum, you're going to see more and more of those traits. But this is a person who feels totally and completely empty inside. So it's, there's this bottomless pit that they need to feel like they want to fill. It's a void inside of them, emptiness. And so they try to fill this emptiness, this black hole with external factors, external things. And it can look like image. It can look like money. It can look like people around them. It can look like big bank accounts, big houses, it, you know, things like that, which I call diamond level supply, how they look to the world. Or it can look like degrading people, controlling people, manipulating people, passive aggressive acts, things like that, which I call coal level supply, you know, the kind of like the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply. Anything that's going to try to feed that emptiness inside of them but it's a black hole. It can never be filled. So that's really what a narcissist is. It's a person who feels totally and completely empty inside. And that's why they have no empathy because it's, it's all about trying to feed here. And so if like, if you have a toothache or something, you can't feel anything about anybody else at that point. Cause all you can think about is yourself and your mm -hmm. own pain. So then what is a covert, this might be too advanced at this point, there might be another level before this, but what is a covert passive aggressive narcissist? Because that's what led you to this work is having to deal with a colleague mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. categorize like this. Right. So I think it's easier to start maybe with a grandiose or an overt narcissist, because that's the kind I think that most everybody 
knows. That's the only kind I ever thought existed. I mean, as a lawyer, I everybody was a narcissist, you know, that came through the doors. Oh, he's a narcissist. She's a narcissist. And I think as a lawyer, you kind of start to become inured to it. You know, I don't practice anymore because I do this full time now. But at the time, everybody was a narcissist. He's a narcissist. She's a narcissist. And you kind of think, okay, everybody's a narcissist. That's why I had to ask the definition because I feel like so many of us just assume we know what it means. Right. But I really sort of thought of a narcissist as a male, misogynistic, sort of chauvinistic, big mouthed person who was filling the room, demanding the best table in the restaurant, interrupting people. All about them. All about them. You know, that's what I sort of thought a narcissist was. I didn't really realize there were other types of narcissists. And deeper. And deeper, right? But what a covert narcissist is, and it can be male or female, by the way, is a person who seems really nice on the surface. Everybody thinks they're great. But just underneath the surface is this rage and jealousy. And they could be humanitarians. They can be, you know, doctors, lawyers. They could be anything. But just underneath it is this insecurity, this rage, this jealousy. And they really only reserve their behavior for their targets and so how it comes out is passive aggressiveness it come and there's always sort of an element of what i call clean hands or plausible deniability so you know can never really quite come back to to them that they've done something wrong necessarily but it's sort of death by a thousand cuts to their target so it might be uh, you know an inadvertent inadvertent email the chain that they left you off of oh i you know how come you didn't make it to the meeting Mm. oh i i I really thought i had you on that email chain how did that happen oh i don't i don't know how that happened you know or it might be smearing you but in terms of care so smearing another person in terms of care Oh, I'm so concerned about Susie and her drinking. Mm. (laughs) So worried about her. Just worried. You know, like that. But, you know, it's she's clearly smearing. Yeah. What were some of the examples of your covert narcissist that what did they do? Because I feel like we need more examples to understand. Like it took me forever. I didn't know what gaslighting was until it became so popular in you know the lexicon and and so then i was like oh my god i've been gaslit so much in my life but now i understand what that is but it takes a lot of examples i feel like with some of this stuff so if you have more examples i'd love to hear yeah so it'll be like i'll you start off where everything is amazing everything is wonderful you know you you have to be t- together, whether it's business partners or you have, you know, whether it's romantic, you know, everything is absolutely fantastic. You, where have you been all of my life? So it's 50 emails a day. It's, you know, we've got to get together. I can bring you all the best business contacts. I can, you know, fill in all the gaps for all of the things that you don't have. And we're going to do this together and we're going to do that together. And it, this is professionally or personally, you know, so let's meet the family or let's do this or let's do that. And this is going to be amazing. And creatively, we're going to do this or whatever it is. Right. And then as soon as you lock it in, you know, the the ink is dry on the on the contracts for the partnership or the you've moved in together or you've put the person on the bank accounts or you've whatever it is. As soon as that happens, you start to see the red flags. You know, where is the money that the person promised that they were going to bring to the table? Oh, you know, I'm I'm waiting for this loan to come through. I, you know, I I I still have to talk to my banker. It's 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 coming, 
but it hasn't happened yet. You know, I promise that I'm working on it, but you know, I, it, it'll, I'm, it'll be coming soon. Okay, sure. Where is it? And then you're, you're now you're starting to nag, you know, or I promise I'll pay you back. Oh, okay, sure. What about those contacts that you said that you had? Oh, yeah, I've talked to them. I'm still following up. Okay, sure. What about your piece of this, you know, plan that you were supposed to be drafting? Yeah, I'm working on that. Okay. And it's just excuses and excuses, excuses and excuses. Yeah. Well, you know that I'm, um, I've been sick or I've, I'm dealing with all this drama mm -hmm. over here. And well, meanwhile, you know, this needs to get done. Well, I guess I'll just do it, you know, but meanwhile, you know, you're in business meetings and then the person is taking credit for, you know, their, your work and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, or you see the person in interviews and they're, you know, using quotes from your stuff as if it's your, their own, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of thing. So, <clears throat> and then you're sort of like, do you say something or do you not? Yeah. I mean, right. I, I mean, I've been in the situations <laughs> way too many times <laughs> right. um, where... I had people purposely torpedoing me and I swear they just had fun behind the scenes just watching me suffer. I swear they like had a monitor and they all sat on reclining chairs with popcorn and just loved it because I just would be so dumbfounded at and, and it was like I would book an interview and all of a sudden my co-host would purposely not show up so that I would be late to go do the interview because it was a big interview. And now he was jealous that I didn't get it. He didn't get it. So he would purposely be late so that my day would go late because I had to work with him. And and then even, you know, a boss colluding with the talent. And no, you don't have vacation. No, no, no. I, in my contract, I have vacation. No, talk to this person. Then I'd go to that person. No, no, no. Talk to that person. Then I go talk to that person. Then they send me back to this to her. And she'd be like, you don't have vacation. Talk to the bosses. I'm like, but it's in my contract. And I, they made me feel like I was crazy all the time. And you want to say you saved my life. I did not want to live while working in this one place. Well, me, a very happy person. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens. Or, you know, you find out that a meeting was moved up a half an hour. Mm -hmm. but And they didn't you know, tell you. They didn't tell you. And so then you end up half an hour late. Oh, I swear I, I, I thought I mm -hmm. told you about that. Oh, no, you never told me. Oh, oh, I look. And then they look at their phone. Oh, for some reason, the text didn't go through. I thought that it did. Sorry. It's, so is it gaslighting and narcissism? Because it feels like it's both. Well, gaslighting is always a part of narcissism. Yeah. You know? I never thought about it like that. I always kind of thought of them as separate, but that's their weapon. That is their weapon. But everybody else thinks they're so nice. Oh, my God. Everybody else thinks they're so yes. nice. Oh, you're Except so for all the victims that have been left be behind. Working <laughs> with her. She's so wonderful. It must be so wonderful to be partners with her because she's so wonderful. She's so nice. Mm. In my case, everyone knew these people were evil, <laughs> um, but no one knew how to navigate it. No yeah. one knew how to do it. Well, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's so great. <laughs> so crazy. It's like the worst pain in the world. I had people say, well, why didn't you quit? I'm like, I couldn't quit. I was taking care of my family. I was responsible financially for elders with health issues. Like I had my family on my shoulders. Mm. So no, I couldn't quit. It was a lot of money. And there was no other way. You couldn't quit. You're under contract too. There's just, and there was no human resources. And even by the way, when there is human resource, sometimes they're all in cahoots together and they make you look like you're the problem. They make you look like the problem. And I was believing. I kept going to my therapist. I'm like, I must be the problem. And she's like, the very thought that you're coming in thinking you might be the problem is the reason why you're not the problem. <laughs> yeah, but th but that's what they do. So many so many times when you get out of the situation, 
then they will go and smear you Mm -hmm. and tell everybody else that you were difficult. You were the problem. Yeah. And so I, I remember just watching so many people dropping with cancer and so many people getting brain tumors. And then we got them. Me and my mom got them. And my mom had a toxic situation at work. I always say, like, I think if you're excelling in your job, there are so many mediocrities who want to just take you down and hurt you. Mm-hmm. And my mom was working in a school cafeteria. She was bright. She would go to a 5 a.m. job early so she could cook breakfast for all of her colleagues. So when they arrived, they had breakfast. So many people were so cruel to her. Mm. And they were very low consciousness people. Mm-hmm. And they were cruel to her. Mm. And and we're, it was just awful. And you're like, wait. This is somebody who's doing a nice thing for you. Like, I I don't understand, but I get it. They don't, there's such a discrepancy between your performance and her performance that you need to now somehow bomb hers to make yours look better. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that if there's a jealousy there, you know, people are going to, for, for whatever reason, some people think that other people's success has anything to do with them when it has nothing to do with them. You know, and I always say that if a flower blooms in one, you know, in a garden, the other flower next to it, does, you know, knows that it has nothing to do with that flower blooming. You know, all the flowers can bloom and it's But beautiful. when there's one job and a couple people are competing for that new title the only one flower is getting that title, right? No, not necessarily. There's many other jobs in the universe. But if you've invested in this company for a long time, I'm just giving an example. If you've invested in a company for a long time, there's this big promotion, you're going after it, and there's all these other people going after it too, you know, I can see where that analogy won't help them necessarily. People have to think of the, the universe as abundant and not scarcity. And, and and that's the problem with people's thinking. They think of the universe as small. As, you know, they, they come from a scarcity. You know, the root of the word scared is, you know, scarcity is scared and, and fear-based. And that's narcissists are very fear-based mm-hmm. individuals and instead of abundant thinking individuals. Mm-hmm. And, and so they want to control people from that place. And, you know, when you're in those types of relationships and in those types of situations, that's what you're dealing with. And, you know, I mean, I just remember in, in when I was in that business partnership, I didn't know this person was a narcissist. I just remember thinking, I'm I'm not playing into this. I'm not playing into this type of of game. I don't want to play this game. This is not who I am. But yet I knew that it was making me miserable. I knew that I I couldn't sleep at night. I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it. I was waking up in the morning thinking about it. I started obsessing about it. I started like losing my hair. I was like getting rashes, you Mm, know. I got the rashes too. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm like, this is make I'm miserable yeah. over here, and getting so, sick. Yeah, it was, and make, you're in fight or flight. Yes, which causes illness eventually. Illness, yes, and so I mean, I remember being at the top of a mountain in Haleakala with my daughter in Maui. This is July of 2019, and my daughter, and my husband, we get up in the middle. of you know, you, you get up at like three o'clock in the morning, you go watch the sunrise. It was two things I hate, which is getting up in the morning hmm. early and, you know, it's cold out. But by the time you get up there, it's spectacular. It's like, you know, heaven on earth, it's magical. And my 17 year old daughter, who, you know, is, is odd by nothing at 17, you know, but she was like, oh my God, mom, it's heaven on earth. And this, you know, um, Hawaiian guy starts singing and it's amazing. And what am I thinking of at that moment? I'm thinking of the freaking narcissist, right? Yeah. And I thought, and that moment was like my aha moment. I thought, no, 
no, no, no, no, no. You do not get to be here. <laughs> you do not get to be here in heaven on earth. And that was my aha moment. I thought every moment I give this person, I am allowing myself to be a victim. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's it. I'm done. I am. I got to get out of this relationship. And so I will walk down that mountain and I just th thought I'm done. And well, it's no different than being with an abusive partner. Yeah. So if you're looking at other people who and maybe judging them for being with an abusive partner, you might be with an abusive situation just in your workplace. Like it's, it's similar. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes and no, obviously. But I think um, I, it is a relationship is what I'm trying to say. A hundred percent. I mean, and I had been bullied as a kid for being Asian and, you know, it brought back all these feelings in me of being bullied because I it was just that feeling of being disempowered and voiceless and all of that. And, and I tell people this because I had already built one of the most successful law practices in the country at this point. I had been representing billionaire celebrities, you know, people of power. And, you know, I, and this happened to me, and, you know, so I tell people all the time, they don't attach themselves to you because you have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much. Mm. And it doesn't matter who you are. They're really good at what they do. Yes. So if you don't know the signs, if you don't know what you're doing, it can happen to anybody. So, you know, having the skills, knowing what you're doing is so important because then you can be prepared. So I know you've said there are more narcissists than ever. Mm -hmm. I remember Dr. Drew, who you've been on his show. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Dr. Drew years ago writing a book about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And I think it was at the beginning of social media too. Mm -hmm. um, and talking about what an epidemic this mm -hmm. was going to be. And mm -hmm. here we are mm -hmm. in it. So knowing that the landscape is filled with these people, and by the way, we should have some empathy for them because they are empty inside. Mm -hmm. And and there's, so I, I've, I think the problem is, is we are empathetic and they're not. So we can see them and feel bad for them, <laughs> which is kind of dangerous. Yeah, but I always say send them light, but over there. Over there, <laughs> yeah. But with so many in the landscape, we're all going to bump into them, right? Mm -hmm. We're all going to keep working with them. I love getting to do what I do because I mitigate the risk of having narcissists around me and toxic people around me. Um, and so I'm really grateful as somebody who's just dealt with so much of it. I've had amazing people along the journey too, but these people just outshine them. Unfortunately, they just, they make it so painful. And then of course you get very sick too, but, um, how do we deal with them? Can we coexist with them? Do we always have to escape them? I always had to dig the escape route and get away. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I, I I do want to explain, and it's actually interesting you brought up Dr. Drew because it was his book that I used in my book to kind of explain what's going on with narcissists in their brain. So I do want to explain that because I think it's important to understand the brain chemistry of how a narcissist was formed because I think it's so fascinating because I think once you understand that, you can start to take it less personally. And then you can start to take the baby steps to do what I call a complete course correction to sort of do a 180 to, to break free using my slay method. So first of all, how a narcissist was formed, which was, is as a result of trauma in their childhood, which is when, and you, you mentioned fight or flight, when any of us are in stressful situations, we do go into this fight or flight. But what happens is our bodies emit these chemicals, these hormones, these stress hormones, uh, and it's mostly adrenaline and cortisol, right? And it happens with children too. So, but when children are 
exposed to this on a continuous basis, it can cause arrested development in the limbic system part of the brain, the emotional center of the brain. So then as they grow up and, you know, they continue to develop, the prefrontal cortex part of their brain might continue to develop the part, you know, responsible for maybe reasoning and that sort of thing. But the limbic system part of their brain, if, if it's continued, you know, if, if they continue to be, um, you know, in stressful situations, that part of their brain will experience this arrested development. And so there's actually a disconnect between the development of the prefrontal cortex and the, the limbic system, meaning that they really are sort of toddlers stuck in adult bodies mm. from a from a, an emotional development point of view. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is that, yeah, they can function as adults in some ways, but when they are presented with situations that cause them to be triggered, such as anything, it could be nonverbal, it could be verbal, but such as, let's say, you know, an eye roll or a slight or any perceived slight. It could be a tone of voice. It could be, it's usually not reasonable. It's not reasonable to a, to a rational person. But when they are triggered in some way, it, triggers this what what they call narcissistic injury now the other thing about narcissists is they have something a, a, a part of their personality called splitting meaning that everything for them is black and white it's good or bad it's you know you're either for them or against them so what happens is that they go from you know you're for me or against me so as soon as that happens that trigger happens now they're in that that limbic system that limbic system takes over well the other part of the um the uh, their um, emotional center that the limbic system uh, controls is parts of memory so what happens is that they actually don't even remember how, what they did or said when that limbic system is in control. Mm-hmm. So they literally don't remember what they're doing during that time. Mm-hmm. And the other problem is that they're blind to the collateral damage that they're causing oh my God. during that time. And not only are they blind to the manipulation, the 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 abuse. rage, the, the abuse that they're causing to the other person during that time, they're blind to it, to the, the, the problems that they're causing for themselves. Yeah. And so they... they it's like a delete. They're just deleted there. Yeah. They so don't know anything. They literally will take themselves down to take you down. And so... You cannot communicate or negotiate with a narcissist in the same way that you can a rational reason or reasonable person. I'm so glad you just explained that because, I mean, I have someone in my life that's been very, very hard to deal with and exactly what you're saying. And I was dumbfounded because I'm like, how, how do you not, how can you not admit to something that happened every single day and you think it might have happened once? Might it's it's so unbelievable to me the way they twist the story or the truth but it's not like you said it's it's their limbic brain that just it's gone it's gone that they really don't even know so they really don't they're in their know. genuine heart they don't believe they did any of this genuinely do not know it's almost wow. like you have to deal with them as if you're dealing with a, an autistic person mm-hmm. or a, you know whatever person might have some sort of arrested development going on in their brain. Wow. And so I tell people to, you know, in my SLAY method, S stands for strategy. 
So the first part of strategy is creating, you know, GPS, figuring out that vision, where it is that you want to go, and then creating that action plan. Well, part of that action plan is step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. Because you got to create these little baby steps because you first feel like, oh my God, I'm so paralyzed because I don't know what to do. It's too yeah. hard. It's too hard. To get away from the narcissist. Right. Because you've been so conditioned, yeah. you know. And and so, you know, that first step is just one boundary, just one boundary, which is I am not going to allow myself to be spoken to in a way that's disrespectful. And is that something, I have a friend that I just happened to see an Instagram post where she said, you don't say your boundaries, you show them. Right. What do you believe? Well, well yeah. And and you know what? It, maybe you even start, maybe, maybe your first step is even just to take a look at the person as if they are a toddler having a tantrum on the floor and just starting to observe them as that. And knowing that you can you can not take this personally mm -hmm. and and i say observe don't absorb observe don't absorb because you know that this is what's happening now and i say just put like this invisible shield down around you just sort of like picturing this invisible invisible shield and then be like superman with the teflon with the bullets or wonder woman with the with the gold bracelets that you know uh um that uh take the bullets off of you or whatever you know because if you understand what i just explained about the brain you can just start to say you know like i can see that you're upset i can see that you're angry you know, we can continue this conversation when you're less angry. You know, when a two-year-old is having a tantrum on the floor, you don't get down there and get angry with them. You just go, I can see that you're angry. You know, like that's what you just need to start to do is just sort of like start to observe their behavior to them. Well, I think that also helps you take back the power because I feel like narcissists prey on empathetic people. Right, because it's what they're they missing. Well, if they're people, missing it, they need it somehow. So they they get it in a weird way like that, right? Not just people who are empathetic, but people who have what I call leaky boundaries. Oh, yeah. I had none. <laughs> yeah. But that's why people they got the better of me. Up. People who don't speak up. People who are going to be like, okay, that just happened. I, I guess tried I'm to speak up, but it doesn't help. But I had leaky boundaries anyway because I wasn't taught to have them. I didn't understand them. But I think for a lot of us, we just kind of get caught off guard and then we don't know how to how to deal with it. And then we feel like either we're the problem or we don't know how to solve it. We don't know how to get out of it. And we're just sucked into this this abyss of of torture and pain. Um, and, and you don't know how to take back that power. But if you now are educated, like you said, on what you just told us. And you now approach it like that. Because there are people who I saw surviving in the system. I mean, not thriving, but surviving in the system. And they never they never tried to, to go to those people as much because they weren't as fun, right? It was more fun to take someone that is going to really give them what they want, which is that pleasure of, of that fight or whatever it is. Um, so if we can look at them as kind of that wounded person, we can take that like elevated position and say, wait, it's not me, right? it's them. I thought it was me for a long time. N and I would go into new jobs thinking, okay, this time I'm not gonna talk at all. I'm not gonna like engage with anybody. I'm just gonna say hello and be nice and then I'm gonna get out and I'm just, I'm just, I, I kept trying to reform who I was because I thought it was me, it had to be me. Right, and I think also as women, I, you, you know, I, I, this is what I found, at least for me, as a, as a lawyer, as an advocate, you know, I'm speaking up on behalf of somebody else. No problem. I can, mm -hmm. I can go. I've heard this toe. from so many powerful women. No problem whatsoever. But in this partnership where it's supposed to be my peer, it's supposed to be, you yeah. know, for you when it's for you. Yeah. And it's supposed to be my friend, you know, and I'm supposed to be you know, the good person, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, 
uh, I'll just let that one slide and, you know, uh, I'll be the good, good person. I'll be the good guy. I don't want to look like I'm being difficult. So I'll let that one go too. I don't want her to go tell people that I'm difficult, you know, and, and so you, you, you let too much go. Well, yeah, because also as women, we get all the labels, like you said, difficult, diva, Bitchy. nightmare, bitch. Yeah. I will say the only thing that gave me solace is anytime I worked outside of those narcissistic systems and worked with other people, it was pure bliss. And so I would say, well, how come it can be so great over here? And over here, it's so bad. But I definitely worked in a really rough area of our business. And I see it now. I see. And then eventually I had to see it wasn't me. It was that system because it wasn't also just me in those systems. There were literal bodies piled up before me and there after me um, in every sense of the word, actually, unfortunately. So, yeah, I mean, and then when you're working with people who are keeping their word and doing what they say they're going to do at the same time, they say they're going to do it. Everything works. Everything flows and everybody's great. And it's no problem. It's only when you're in situations where people are trying to take advantage of you mm -hmm. and, you know, then it, it, it becomes a problem because especially covert passive aggressive narcissists, because, you know, they tend to lie, lie, <laughs> let you do all the work, take credit for it. You know, try, they're super jealous. They're not happy for you when good things happen for you. You know, it, it's 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 a problem. You know, I mean, I, my and I was so out of my element because I had been, you know, back in a place in, in Florida where all my girlfriends were people who were happy for me when good things happened to me. And so I was like, oh my God, I, what's going on here? You know? <laughs> and this is when you came here to Cali. And when I had just came, <laughs> come, you know? Yeah. So I call that stepping on the rake. Yeah. I went well, to work with a friend once thinking, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. We're going to be working together. We can do this. We can do that. And yeah. I stepped on the rake. Well, since then, I found some great people here, you know, since, you know, I, I raised my vibration and I started attracting good people here. But, you know, I, it, it, this is when I first, first came. Okay, Rebecca, we're going to take a quick break till tomorrow because I think I want everyone to digest this part first before we get into the real nitty gritty of how to slay this bully um, tomorrow. So friends, come back tomorrow for the final part of my conversation with Rebecca. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.